to the workshop of Cade South All Racing. We're recording this on Wednesday the 21st of October 2015. In a few days time on the weekend of the 25th and 26th, I well, think it's the 24th and 25th actually, we're running at Phillip Island with our racing car, our Formula Ford. We're hoping to set pole position and win race one, two and three. So by the time uh, we've uh, finished this coming weekend, hopefully we'll be winners and they say winners are grinners. Why I'm talking to you is to share with you how to build a winning racing car. And my background, apart from being a racing driver many years ago, was running a personnel company. And I used to go to organisations that weren't working right and fix them up. Now all organisations, whether they know it or not, and most of them don't, operate on a system called cultural scripting. Many people know it as corporate culture, but it's taken from the cultural script terminology, which is pure psychology. All organisations take on, like you hear the old boy network types, it's, ho, oh, oh ho, old boy, how are you going? That's a cultural script group. Bogan's another group. And different gangs around the world take on cultural scripts. These scripts are very important to them. Companies take on script and motor racing teams take on scripts. Now the script to run a successful motor racing team is engineering excellence. Now tonight we'll be looking at some of the Formula One teams because whether they know it or not, and I think they basically don't know, they run on cultural scripts, which has a big bearing on how successful they're going to be. Now some of the scripts of the Formula One teams are, as I view it, Mercedes engineering excellence. It's engineering excellence that you need to produce a top race winning motor car. And to do that, you need the right personnel in place. So it's a personnel function before it becomes a motor racing function. Teams like Ferrari, in my opinion, for many years has been living in the past, refusing to bring about change and burying the head in the sand. I think Michael Shoemaker changed that to a large extent, but they always would return to where they came from. I think Red Bull was very much it's very much today an engineering excellence team, but I think they're being hampered with a, a lack of a good power unit at this time as we record this in October 2015. Now, the team that impresses me most in Formula One at the moment is the Mercedes team. And one of the key people, that, or two key people in that team as I see them, is Toto Wolff. I watch him on the television. He seems a very, very good role shifter, a good person. And Nicky Lauda I find interesting as well, He's a no bullshit person, and he stops any bullshit or big headedness around the place, and that's good. Another problem for some of the teams is the personality profile of some of the personalities that are involved. I'm going to show you on the screen here now how this works and how it impacts a racing team like ours and Formula One. How it works is this, there's a matrix grid on personality profiling, and it works like this. The top people up here uh, non-emotional. We call it non-emote. Excuse my writing. These down here are more open and friendly, so I will put down here open for them. These will avoid conflict and these will attack. Now the four profiles are these. The first one is the analytical. Now these tend to be dull, colourless and boring, orderly, correct, fastidious, proper, attention to detail, slow decision makers, based decisions on factual data. So their whole world revolves around facts and figures and uh, facts, they're factual people, that's how their, their life works. The second type is the amiable, put down AIM for them. Now these people tend to be very friendly, easygoing, supportive, tend to procrastinate a little bit, Helping along people like to go along with uh, the flow and don't like undue pressure and nastiness around the place. Now, a third part, part is the autocrat. We put the AU for autocrat. And these people are bound in Formula One. You only have to watch the television and you'll see them. They are hard to get to know, independent, narrow-minded, arrogant. And because of the independent, narrow-minded, arrogant stance, they make very bad decisions are made and they basically throw their weight around and they're usually major stress carriers to anyone around them. So they basically tell you how things are going down, you either do it this way or get the hell out of there. They, I've seen one of them on the television say, we know what we're doing. Well, they make a very good car and they're a very slick operation, but one particular individual there is massive stress carrier to anyone around him. And there's another team 
Well, I don't want to mention these teams. I don't want to get uh, end up in court with libel. But there's another team that's very, very successful and floating around that team is a very autocratic individual and he causes a lot of stress. And the team manager is more of an amiable type. He keeps the peace to a large extent and he has to. But the damage this other fellow can inflict in a few minutes is massive. Now, the third one is the expressive. Now, these people are very friendly, easygoing, fun-loving, inspirational, motivational, ideas people. people. They're very um, intuitive and very creative. But as far as planning goes, they're terrible. I'm one of those myself, so I'm, I'll put my hand up for that one straight away. These people find these people here a pain in the butt. They find them loud and giddy. These amiables find the autocrats too smashing their way through things too much, and these autocrats... Uh, the, aim, uh, the autocrats find them weak as they view it. So once you start to bring these dynamics into a team, you're into a lot of trouble. That's for Formula One to work out. I'm not here to fix them up. I'm talking about my team here, our team. Now, if you're going to select an engineer to engineer the car, you just think for a minute, which personality profile is going to be best for you to set the car up? Is it the very formal, proper, analytical, is it the procrastinating aim bill, is it the smash our way through an autocratic or the zany expressive? The expressive will say, oh yeah, give that a couple of turns on the back end and go out and see how it goes. The amiable, he'll procrastinate, oh I don't quite know what to do here, um, I'll have a think about it. We're in a hurry here, we haven't got time to wait. The autocrat driver, they'll say, do it this way, that's how it's done and the driver will fix it up himself. Well, the analytic will look at the notes and factual data and make us a sensible decision. So in my opinion, the person who is part amiable, mostly analytical, is the person who you need to engineer your car. And I think the Red Bull have their man. Our team, we have our man too. I have selected the person to run our car, a man called David Bruce. He's, uh, he's a very much an analytical with an amiable bent here. So when we get to the races and in the preparation before the races, he takes control of the team and he makes the shot. He's the man. I have no say in it. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to David Bruce. David is a former very successful racing car driver. He'll tell you himself what he's done. I, it's better he tell you this. And he will show you how you set up a racing car from scratch. So this particular car is a 2001 Van Diemen, which we imported from the United Kingdom in 2003. And then he took control of it, and then he set the car up. And when we go to the races, he's the man who runs the team and liaises with the driver and works on tactics. So we're very, very lucky to have David Bruce, and he's the type of person you need to run your team. So I'd like to now introduce you to David Bruce. Howdy, my name is David Bruce. As Terry's introduced, I help him with this car and running the team at various race meetings. My background, I'm an engineer, been in the automotive industry for 33 years. I also used to race myself, prepare my own cars. Um, my last car was a Formula 2 that I won the Australian Championship in. A little different to this car, but the basic setup is the same. Let's assume that you've just got yourself a new car or you're just starting up again with a new car. The first thing you've got to do is get some data, some information from the previous owners, from the tyre manufacturers, anything you can get about how you're going to set the car up, what camber angles, what caster, tyre pressures, that kind of thing, anything you can get. This is going to be your initial information, it's not your final set point, but it's somewhere to start. Once you've got your car, particularly if it was a successful car in the previous owner and you have this information, it's quite valuable, you then have to go and check things. First thing to do, clean the car, pull the bodywork off, clean everything, look for cracks, look for things that are leaking, that kind of stuff. It's much better to find it in the garage several weeks out from the race meeting than at the track when you've got no time to fix these things. Once you're confident the car's in good shape, you start with the suspension setup. The first thing you need if you've got a proper racing car with proper adjustable suspension is that the wheels can be positioned anywhere. So you've got to make sure that both wheels on both sides of the car are the same distance from the centre and at the same distance forward. Similarly at the back you're going to do the same thing, same distance out, same distance back. Typically, what I would do is adjust these lower arm adjustments here, measure from the bottom of the pivot of the upright to the centre and to the centre at the back. And if those dimensions are the same and those dimensions are the same, then you've got the wheels in the right place to start with. From there, you can start doing things like your camber, which you adjust with the upper arm to bring the wheels in, the caster, which you're going to pull back 
again with the upper arms, just pull the top of it back. And of course then finally your toe in, which is the toe link at the front here. So you get, typically in a race car like this, it'll be toe out to get your thing to turn in for you. Once you've got that set up, you can do the same on the back. This can all be done with very cheap equipment. You don't need to go and buy a big Dunlop machine or anything like that. I use a piece of string, a spirit level, a ruler and a tape measure. It costs about 25 bucks to set the whole car up. It's very important when you do this that you're precise. You need to have, be able to measure everything and get the same measurement each time you do it. So practice that. You also need to be very accurate. If you have one and a half millimetres tone at the rear versus half a millimetre tone at the rear, the car's going to have wildly different handling characteristics. Basically, with the more tone at the rear, every time you put the foot in, the car's going to tend to go straight. You're not going to steer it coming out of a corner. You have to wait before you can get on the power. That'll slow you down. If you can get the thing accurately just towed in, you better get the power out of the corner nice and early. If it's towed out, if you've made a mistake and it's actually towed out, the thing's going to tend to come round on you. You may set that up for different reasons, but generally, and a car on a good track, that will be slower. So that's the basic setup of the suspension. When you're getting all this information on a car like this, where you have the option of changing ratios and things, you're going to need to find out what ratios you need for the various tracks. If you've bought the car from overseas, typically you won't have that information with the car. You're going to have to ask other competitors. You'll be surprised. In a country with 22 million people, there are perhaps 200 people running Formula Ford, less in Formula 2. They will tend to help you. They want their category to succeed. They want cars on the track. They will give you, again, a starting point. The reason I call the starting points, all the suspension and the brakes and everything else, and the gear ratios, when you get to the track, that's when you start measuring things. You're going to actually measure how your car goes. Is your car understeering? Is your car oversteering? How are your tyre pressures? The, biggest, the best thing you can do with regard to tyre pressures of camber is measure the temperature. You want to measure the outside, the centre and the inside. If the Three temperatures are telling you that you've got an even temperature grade across the tyre, your camber set up right. If the tyre pressure in the middle, tyre temperature in the middle is too high, it's going to indicate you've got too much tyre pressure. Too low, obviously too low tyre pressure. If you have too much heat on the outside versus the inside, you can tell whether the camber needs to be increased or decreased. Very important tools, but this is, as you run the car and as you develop the car, you're developing your own suspension settings to suit that car on that track on that day. It'll change as the weather changes, it'll change as you change tracks, and it won't be necessarily what you started with. If you're a new driver, or if you're a new driver to the category, you're going to have also some training to do with the driver. The best thing to do, there are schools, there are other things you can do, but the best thing you can do is find someone who's fast and follow them. They will show you where the lines are. Brake where they brake, turn where they turn, apex where they apex. You're going to find it hard to keep up with some of these guys initially. Hang on to them as long as you can. Find the next fast guy, chase him around the place. This is the best way to learn. These guys are fast for a reason. They know what they're doing. So follow their lines, do what they're doing. If you find that you can't keep up for some reason with your car, now you've got some information about what your car's doing. If you find, for example, that as you turn the wheel, the car isn't responding, you're tending to go straight as you enter the corner, that's called understeer. You can now go back to your crew and we can help to dial it out. Now, there are a number of ways of doing it. I typically like to see if we can add traction, because that will ultimately make the car faster. So I'll check tyre temperatures, that kind of stuff, make sure the camber and the tyre pressures are right and we're getting the best grip out of the front that we can. If we already have the best grip we can, what you can then do is look at things like stabiliser bars. If you make the front stabiliser bar stiffer, you will make it tend to understeer more. If you make it rear stabiliser bar stiffer, you'll tend to make it oversteer a bit more and you can dial out some of the understeer. If you find as you're going through the corner that you're now in a situation where you've got the, the wheels looking the opposite way and you're still going that way because you're chasing the tail around, that's called oversteer. Again, you check the rear, check you've got the right camber, check you've got the right tyre pressures, and if all that's right, adjust the stabiliser bars. Generally going tight is good on a flat smooth track. It tends to catch you out when they're getting a little bit wet or if they're getting a bit rough, in which case you may choose to back the opposite bar off rather than tightening up the bars. The biggest problem you're going to have, and the, the advantage I had when I was in the, racing my own cars, is that I was the engineer and the driver. Your biggest problem you're going to have is telling the engineer what he needs to know so he can set the car up for you. You need to break the corners into three sections. The turn in, the middle part of the corner, and the exit. Turn in is pretty obvious. At the end of the braking, when you first turn in the steering wheel. 
what affects that part of the turn-in is different to what affects the middle of the corner to what affects the tail of the corner. If you don't tell him where you're having the understeer or the oversteer, he can't make the right decisions as to what to change. Equally, on the way out of the corner, when you're starting to apply the throttle, that's another set of criteria. You can change different things. For example, as we mentioned before, the tone at the rear. If you're finding that as you come out of the corner, it's understeering, it won't go where you point it, it could be the rear toe-in. Similarly, you can do things with the front toe-in, you can do things with the roll centre heights, front and rear, by adjusting the ride heights, that type of stuff. So you need to be able to communicate with your engineer what it is the car is doing at what point on the track that it's doing it. And this will all help you. Remember, we're recording this in uh, late October 2015, so hopefully this will be on the YouTube for a while. As we speak, the Red Bull team are having a very difficult season because the Renault power is not good compared to the Mercedes and they're suffering. Now, all racing cars, they call it straight line handling. There's a little saying they use. You have to have the engine power. See, when you get out of a corner, you need to get the engine down as quickly as possible. That's where David's skill comes in to set the chassis up. Because when you think about it, the distance between the power on point out of a corner and the absolute latest for braking, if it can be, let's say, 1,000.231 yards and you've got a bit more uh, speed in there than your opposition, you'll go quicker than them, providing the handling's good. So this straight line handling of powerful engines is a very important thing. So I was finding it hard to find good horsepower. So what I did, I went to Quicksilver Racing Engines in Fredericks in Washington, the United States. And Sandy and Eric there helped me and they sold me a very, very, very good head. Extremely good head. They directed me to High Tech Exhaust in Irvine, California. What they call Gradinsky. You can go there and get a good exhaust from him. He makes beautiful equipment. And we put it on the dyno and we immediately gained a horsepower just by bolting this exhaust system on compared to the other. Well, I've nearly finished, but I'm probably saving one of the most important features of the car to last. We've got a very good engine, we need to look after it. Davies Craig, an Australian company, invented the electric water pump some years ago, and we used it on our racing car. It absolutely surprised me. I knew it was a good thing, but more so than I ever realised. Some of the great benefits that this pump gives us for competition racing is that we're normally at the front of the grid. So by the time we go out there on our warm-up lap, we end up on the grid, sometimes waiting a long time for the stragglers to come up. And the cars overheat, we don't want that. We want to keep this engine at a very constant temperature. And this, with the control, enables us to do it. It also gives us a lot of horsepower out of the corner. It is just one hell of a brilliant product. So if you want to use one for your competition vehicles, Davies Craig, they're located in Melbourne, Australia. You contact them and, uh, and you'll be very happy with it, I believe. Well, our time has come to an end. Uh, in a moment or two, we'll be showing you some footage of our visit to Phillip Island. And as I said, our aim was to set pole position and win our three races. We'll see how we go. Thanks for watching.